Welcome to Hooters, the making of older, wiser, lesbian cinema. I'm Ana La Chocha, investigative reporter. And this is an owl, also known as a hooter. They say when lesbians turn 40, they either become owls, older, wiser, lesbians, or just simply become loafs, lesbians over 40. It's the former that interests us tonight. You see, for most women, lesbian culture is a punctual period in time, mainly consulted during our delicate coming out period. It's a moment in our lives we yearn to learn about what it means to be a lesbian, who are our icons, our heroes, our thinkers. Today, as we move towards equality and assimilation into the mainstream, do we still need lesbian culture and the unique perspective we have on the world? I say yes, and luckily, I'm not the only one. Our story begins with filmmaker Cheryl Dunye, best known for making The Watermelon Woman, the first black lesbian film. After a couple of starts and stops in the Hollywood system, Cheryl wanted to return to her roots. I call it sort of like the little rascals form of filmmaking where it's like, you know, our gang, and come on, Buckwheat, come on, Darla, come on, Spanky, let's make a film today. Fate would have it that producers Candy Gutierrez and Ernesto Foronda were also yearning for a return to grassroots filmmaking. We're gonna start this like dinner meetings with like all these queer filmmakers in uh, LA to get them together and like actually start to communicate with each other again. Shell was one of the first proactive ones that said, well, I have a, a project. Cheryl's longtime collaborator, Alex Juhas, producer of The Watermelon Woman, would also join the team. Political issues, contemporary issues in the lesbian community that Cheryl doesn't want to write about, isn't equipped to write about, isn't interested in, are leaking into this movie through this collective because we're shooting the voices of people working on the film. The economic collapse means a lot less crap means a lot less corporate control of the arts. In a matter of weeks, filmmakers, activists, scholars, collaborators of all ages, genders, and sexualities would band together, in front and behind the camera, to form the Parliament Collective and create The Owls, the story of four older, disillusioned lesbians from the 90s, now living secluded lives away from the hubbub and limelight they once knew. Carol, ex-activist and aging black butch. This is where owls go. They go to their little nest. Plays house and hopes for a child with ex riot girl import from London, Lily. Not quite yet committed to the retired family life. You know what? I used to live in London. I had a life there. Their longtime frenemies, Iris. Cocktail. The alcoholic ex riot girl who's still angling for more minutes of fame. And MJ. Iris, do you believe in ghosts? her longtime lover and recent ex. And none of this would have happened if you weren't such a fucking mess. It had been a year since Iris left their nest, that horrible night when they killed that baby dyke, Cricket, and hid the body. Now Iris is back, and she's not the only one. Sky, Cricket's lover, has come to town for revenge. With only a few weeks to prepare, their challenge is to shoot a feature film in six days. Anyone in the one in this room who's ever made a film knows that it's virtually scientifically impossible to shoot 60 pages of a script in five days. With a tiny budget and to do it through the collaborative filmmaking process where absolutely everyone has a say. I think, I think, I don't think, I think also. I feel, I still think. So I just feel like, you know what, none of this shit has anything to do with this. You know, this is fucking bullshit, man. Sound like a recipe for disaster? We'll soon find out. Birds of a feather film together. I guess I feel like, and I felt like this in Cheryl's um, treatment as well, mm -hmm. that the whole, that everything that happens leading up to um, to uh, Cricket being killed is so much more over the top than it needs to be for everything else to happen. Like, 
Yeah. This is in Cheryl's original. I know, I know it is, oh, and yeah. I fully plan to argue with her about it. <laughs> she doesn't have to be, she call her a black bitch. She doesn't have to basically rape me. Like, are we supposed to think that Cricket deserved to die because she's such a little asshole? Yeah. Okay, our generation is depraved. We're doomed, and our lives are hell. Because what everything our parents said about us was true. We can't solve our own problems. But we want the next generation to love us and respect us, and they don't. They're totally different. Right. So we hate them. They have contempt for us, and we resent them. And they're going to be brutal to us, and we're going to kill them. Right. Now this, so this over-the-top plot is a metaphor. Have you ever felt that? I have felt that. Um, <laughs> felt like underappreciated by the younger generation. Like some girl who has power in some job where she can be out, where no one my age at my time ever could be, and then I ask her for help and she treats me like shit. Right. And I want to kill her. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Our generation, who made a lot of things possible for the people after us, we they do not honor us. Do you think a lot of women sacrificed their the, I the, think the, the ideal don't... because of sex in the 90s? No, they gave up power. People who were going to be out, people who were going to be out in the work, going to be out personally, we're not going to play any games, we're not going to have you know ambiguous protagonists and all this stuff. That group of people has paid an enormous professional price, especially in my age group. I came out in 75. You know, you had to be a hero to be out at that point. It's real oppression culture, and everything was a secret. I come from the dirty, dark, secret generation. I mean, I did homosexuality before I knew what it was. I had never heard the word. You know, and that's not possible now. You can see it in every generation. Like, who's better known, Susan Sontag or Audre Lorde? <laughs> Susan Sontag. Susan Sontag. Probably lesbians maybe know Audre Lorde more. I would have to say Audre Lorde is 60%, Susan Sontag 40%. But I think Susan Sontag, Sontag, I would like to say, is probably better known like to the general public. Definitely Audre Lorde. I mean, the name looks familiar to me, and I never read, ever. So, yeah. And then I think Susan Sontag from The Photographer, Annie, uh, Annie Leibovitz. I'm the wrong person to ask because I don't know who either of these people are. Probably neither of them, actually. Honestly, I, I don't know who Susan Sontag is, but I have Audre Lorde's quote tattooed on me. Your silence will not protect you. It's like people, you know, people are so stupid and they can't analyze anything, so they're like, well, we have Ellen, so everything's okay. And I'm like, yeah, she got famous in the closet and then she came out. Look at people who are also comics who are always out. No one's ever heard of them. So like people who had integrity about around their sexuality and in their artwork and in their life, who are my age, I'm 51. Forget it, you, you're in the margin for, forever. The really radical roots of gay and lesbian art making that came authentically from people's experience have been pushed to the side, although they still exist. But that is true for all media and all communities across the board. It's true for black cinema, it's true for everybody. And has the experience of collaborating on the screenplay, is that something that you're more interested in for the future? Well, basically I just wrote what Cheryl wanted. It's fun, but it's not, you know, I'm not expressing myself except for my one key line. What's your one key line? We gave up the key to the kingdom for the sake of your twat. <laughs> That's my line. <laughs>